Uh, on, on different Sundays, uh, well, there it goes. Don't drop your notes. That is bad news. Notes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, having, I'm having our elders jump in and help me out in this series. And so, what am I? Oh, that's what I'm doing wrong. I'm messing this up bad, Mike. Um, and so today, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, they are right. Um, but Mike, Mike is preaching today as we look at a passage, last part of chapter 2 into chapter 3. And then just throughout, this sermon series is really going to go all the way through uh, mid-August. But just we'll kind of trade off back and forth. Some of the elders will preach at times. I'm, I'm back in the pulpit next week. But Mike did an incredible job in the first service, and I'm so thankful for your heart. I just want to pray over you as we begin today, Mike, as you bring God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much uh, for a team of elders here at Hope who God helped navigate and lead and guide this con congregation. God, I thank you for Mike. I thank you for his wife, Kelly, and for their family. And God, for the way you use them as leaders in our church. So God, use him now as he brings your word to us, your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Ken. Well, you ready to have some fun? Me too. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, Paul and what he wrote in uh, Ephesians. We're going to talk about unity, mystery, and mission of God's holy church. That's what this place is here at Hope. It's, it's God's holy church. And before we do that, I want to tell a story. You know, Kelly and I met in Alaska, and uh, we served in a church there as lay leaders for many, many years. It was a big church, Anchorage Baptist Temple. It had about 2,000 people in attendance every week. And um, I was involved in the choir. Kelly was involved in the choir. She was involved in a lot of stuff. Our kids all were born in that city and grew up there and, and were saved there, accepted Christ in that church, sang in a quartet there for many, many years. So very, very active in, in that congregation. But um, one Sunday, the music director comes to me and he says, hey, I'm going to a music conference and I need somebody to lead singing in the church. I said, oh, really? He says, would you be willing to do that? I said, yeah, I probably could help you with that. So he goes to the conference and I go to... Uh, church that Sunday and lead singing, direct the choir, the whole nine yards, you know, the face in the front of it, and then the pastor preaches. A lot of people got saved that day. It was an exciting day. Everything went off without a hitch. Well, on Sunday evening, that this church had church on Sunday nights. We don't anymore, but they did at that time. So at 4.30, we'd get together and have choir practice. Choir would all practice, spend an hour working on songs for the next week or so. And then at 5.30, we'd have a little break where we'd wait till the service starts at 6. So we're all out in the auditorium, sitting in, talking, and people are milling around and coming in. Down on the left of me is the piano and the organ from the pulpit. And Dr. Brock, who's the piano player, he's a big guy, about 350, uh, in his late 50s, 60s, somewhere around there. He's sitting down there talking to Bob Moreland. Well, Bob's about, it looked like Doc's brother, about the same size. And they're cutting it up, talking it up. Juanita Haynes, the organist, is down there. And his family, his wife's milling around. They're all down there. Well, all of a sudden, Doc collapses on the floor, bang, with a massive heart attack. His family goes nuts. They are screaming to the top of the lungs, Doc, hang on, hang on. Doc, hang on. And people that know uh, CPR came running down, rip his shirt open, buttons fly everywhere, and start chest compressions and, and uh, also doing mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. Paramedics are called. Paramedics come in the door. It's a chaotic scene. People in the auditorium are crying. They're praying. It's, it's just like you've never seen before. It's just scary. And so I'm standing there watching this. And watching these people work on Doc. And Dr. Prevo, the pastor, comes up alongside me. He's got this great big Jerry Falwell sized Bible. And he goes, Hmm. Huh. Well, Mike, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I looked at him. I said, Doc, it's your church. What do you want to do? Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, get up there and sing Sweet Hour Prayer. Sweet hour of prayer? Really? Are you kidding? No, get up there and do that. Oh, okay. 
So I go up, get on the pulpit, and I say, everybody's crying and hysterical. So everybody sit down. Let's just relax. Let's be in a prayerful mode for Doc right at this time and pray for him to recover. And, and let's just sing a cappella, Sweet Hour Prayer. So we start singing Sweet Hour Prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. And over in the corner, I hear, Claire, poof. <laughs> Sweet hour of prayer. Claire, poof. Well, I'm hearing this, and we're singing this, and I start to get laugh, start to laugh. And I'm like, oh, God, help me. I cannot laugh right now. I cannot laugh. Don't let me laugh. Well, we're singing, and I just said, well, stage one, I just got to act like I'm crying. So I just go like this. And I go like this. Well, the paramedics get done with Doc. They get him stabilized. They strap him down on the gurney, haul him out, goes to the hospital. Service goes on. They have an offering. They have preaching. People got saved. It was just we went and continued on. Well, several weeks go by, Doc recovers, and he's fine, and he worked in the same building that I did. I worked in the radio stations, and he worked at the Christian school, so I call him up. Hey, Doc, I want to come down and see you. Okay, so I go down, and I said, and I tell him this story, what happened, and he says, well, I'm glad that I had to die to make you laugh. <laughs> it's crazy stuff that happens in church. How many of you know who Adrian Rogers is, or was? I used to work with Adrian uh, with the agency business. We helped syndicate his radio program, and he had that big church down in Memphis called uh, Bellevue Baptist Church. had those huge crosses on the side of the road as you're driving up 40. You see those crosses? He used to tease. He said, yeah, we call this place Fort God. And I said, well, I call it Six Flags Over Jesus. But <laughs> anyway, he was telling a story one time, and I listened to it. It was pretty good. He said, the story about this highly educated woman who had just completed a series of study in first aid. She was driving down the road, and she happened up onto a terrible automobile accident. An old man had been ejected out of the car. He'd hit this big oak tree, cracked his head like an eggshell, and his blood was pulsing out of his body onto the pavement. She said it was gruesome. It was horrible. But then I remembered my first aid. I remembered if I put my head between my knees, I would not faint. Now, folks, really? You know, that's the kind of unity and mystery and mission a lot of churches have today. They'd rather be having their head between their knees and not be singing Onward Christian Soldiers. Instead, they sing Hold the Fort. Today, we're going to see... It's been through a unified purpose and focus on mission that just this particular church today is where it is today. Oak Fellowship is such a place of unity and mystery and mission. We have seen, Kent, you attested this, we've seen real-time miracles in this place. Miracles of people coming to Christ, being forgiven, finding purpose and calling. Miracles of families being blessed with new little ones when the odds were against them. Miracles of God opening up a way for this place of permanence to be here today. That's amazing. You know, if you haven't heard the story of hope, you need, to, you need somebody to tell you about it. But it is a true miracle. It's all God. It's all good. And when we see that what Paul is teaching here, we have to take God seriously at his word. We're going to see about that because Paul was a man of true hope. When you look at Paul's writings in this letter and understand from where he is coming, it almost, for me, I almost break out in a sweat to think about the miracle that occurred that now still transcends and speaks to us today, thousands of years later. Paul was in prison in Rome when he wrote Ephesians. Why was he in prison? Because he'd been preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and salvation to the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, if you were in prison, would you be thinking about the magnitude of the importance of unity and mission in, in the church? I would not have been. I'd have been looking for a place to get out of that thing. 
But Paul counts it all joy and keeps producing words of encouragement and hope from such a hopeless predicament. Paul has seen a lot by now through eyes, eyes that have been blinded previously by God. Paul, when he was Saul, hated Christians, hunted them down, tried to do everything he could to rid cities of what they were teaching. He was a hornet's nest of hate, stirring up whatever he could to put his sandal square on the boot of God's elect. But God takes away the laser focus that Saul had through blinding him and letting him stay that way for a time until Saul repents and God gives him back his sight. And then he gives him something else. He gives him the name Paul. I learned something in this study. They say if you want to learn the Bible, you've got to teach the Bible. So I was in Acts 13, 9. Did you know that the name Paul was a step down from the grander name of Saul? <laughs> but isn't that just the way God works? He, he wants to take the lesser and do greater with it. You see, it's God's plan to take ordinary people and do extraordinary things to ordinary people so that God gets the glory. Paul was on bended knee, such a man, a new man of God. And now thousands of years later, with this ordinary man, did, through teaching unity and mission, still brings glory to God every single day. Paul was the man who founded churches. Paul was the one who instructed unity and mission. He was an early adopter, the first trainer, deep in his heart, teaching from the college of experience. So what is he saying to us about us? You know, here's the boil down. I didn't write all this stuff out. I went and looked at other people's and said, what's David Jeremiah have to say about this? What's Michael Yusuf from Church of the Apostles down in Atlanta? What's he got to say about this? Because they've done writings and studies on Ephesians. So I also took about eight different versions of the Bible and read Ephesians over and over and over and over in all those versions and just kind of got it boiled down to here. We as believers in Almighty God, saved by the power of Jesus Christ's resurrection, have a heavenly citizenship to come. But we were all born in a state of complete separation from God by being sinners. The Gentiles had a bigger separation from God than the Jews did because the Jews at least were taught to anticipate the coming of the Messiah. They had the advantage but blind, blindness. But for Paul, there are two kinds of people he's talking about, Jews and Gentiles. Or put it in another way, the insiders and the outsiders, Okay. Let's read verses 11 through 13 of Ephesians 2. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made flesh by hands. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's the miracle. You know, the Old Testament is full of promises and a sense of anticipation of the coming Messiah. And it's hard for us today to comprehend the tension <laughs> that existed in the early church when the Jews and the Gentiles began receiving Christ as their Savior. The Jews called the Gentiles dogs and declared them unclean. The Gentiles, in turn, held the Jews in contempt, ostracized them, and even persecuted them for their beliefs. Talk about racism. Wow. But God, can you imagine what that was like when they both started seeing Gentiles and Jews accepting Christ. Paul focuses us in this new life today. He makes it clear that God didn't save them or you or me just so we could live isolated individual believers and form a bunch of cliques. God's plan all along was to bring all people together, uniting men and women from diverse backgrounds. 
Jesus died and rose again for the whole world. I think of the song, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Of course, when my kids were little, I used to sing that red and orange, blue and green, from your head down to your spleen. <laughs> you see, when we receive salvation, we become creations in Christ. Old baggage gets out of our lives. Old prejudices. Wrong opinions. Something my uncle called stinking thinking about our fellow man. I always loved it when he said that because he meant it. Sin gets kicked to the curb. Jesus reigns supreme. You know, there are some churches that have not followed these principles. They don't have any unity. They have very little mission. They'd rather succumb to what I call elitist thinking. Blessed be thou and verily, verily. Boring customs, country club mentality. Droning on with a pastor that says, well, it seems to me you know, I'd rather have a boil lance. I have to be a part of a high steeple, few people church, nothing in it alive except the ivy growing up the side of the wall. Today, there are walls that continue to exist, ladies and gentlemen. Many are erected strategically to separate people by race, religion, class, culture, and sex. God have mercy. Those who erect these walls and protect them they're going to have to answer to God. They're enemies of the gospel. Paul was serious and wanted to convey this message with compassion and encouragement. It's as if he's standing on top of the rock and screaming, Folks, this is a real deal. Let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. For he himself is our peace. You know, one of those Bibles I was reading in Ephesians was my dad's Bible. Okay, I'm flipping through the whole thing, and I get over to Ephesians, and dad's Bible has all these little sayings and writings in there, things triple underlined in the paper mate pen, and all this stuff in the Bible. I go to Ephesians, page 1, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Nothing is underlined except for he himself is our peace. Must have spoke to him, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man for the two, from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. You know, uh, as I studied this, I, I read an article where it said that the ancient temple in Jerusalem, the priests used to post signs in both Greek and in Latin that said, no Gentile may enter beyond the dividing wall in the court around the holy place. Whoever is caught will be to blame for this death. Now, is that the uh, campaign to get people to come to church? You know, it's like they're singing the song, bring them in, bring them in. But if you're a Gentile, no, you can't come in. Can you believe that? You can't come in, you can't come in, we'll just kill you at the door. Really? Today there are many homes, many hearts, and many lives with similar signs hanging around their neck. Signs aren't visible, but the message is pretty clear. Do not enter. Leave me alone. Jesus breaks down those barriers, people. Jesus has formed a whole new family, a heavenly family with God as our Father and with our fellow believers as brothers and sisters who have, literally, heavenly blood flowing through your veins. You know, I've been a blood donor for, gosh, since 1995. My wife was going to have surgery 
And we were on one Thursday, we went in for the appointment, sat down with the surgeon. He's telling us about what all's going to happen. Yeah, okay, that's fine. And if there's any complications and she starts to believe we may have blood, we'll have blood set aside uh, to where we can take care of that need, make sure she has enough blood. And I said, hold it. Where do you get the blood? Well, it comes from the general population. And we get it from the blood bank here in Alaska. And, and uh, folks, this is 1995 when the AIDS scare was still a real problem. And they weren't convinced yet that they had purified the blood supply. And there, people were still getting blood transfusions and getting AIDS. And I said, hold it. I don't want any stuff like that. If you don't guarantee it's pure, I don't want that in there for her. What about my blood? We're both the same type. Could you take a pint of mine and put it on archive for her if she needs it? He says, oh, yeah, we could do that. That'd be a pro not a problem. Uh, if we don't use it, we just throw it away. I said, okay. So that was Thursday, Friday. I go to the Blood Bank of Alaska. Man, this place is fancy. I mean, you walk in there. It's a nice big fireplace. There's a moose mounted above. There's food. There's snacks. There's nice overstuffed couches. I mean, it's like a lodge. And you go in there, tap, drop a pint, and go. Now, I know they've got a lot of ways to where you can um, donate today where they've got this filter thing, and it takes all the red blood cells out. I'm not doing that. You're not filtering nothing. I'll drop a pint and leave. So I've done that judiciously <laughs> since 1995. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So I have a funny sense of fun. I know that. But they tell me that for every pint of blood that you donate, it saves three lives. I'm up to 16 gallons and two pints. That's 130 people. Now, you might think I'm boasting. I'm not. Jesus gave all of his blood to save everybody. That's the miracle. That's the mystery. That's the kind of God I want. Let's read Ephesians 19 through 22 of chapter 2. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Folks, it's because of Christ we now have a home, a place of belonging where Christ himself is the foundation. Every builder will tell you, if you don't have a good foundation, it's not going to stand very long. Whatever you're building, it doesn't matter. And without a foundation, it will fall. Now, here is a caution for all of us to take to heart. We've all done this, but whenever we deliberately go back to sin and rebellion, we remove ourselves from the protective covering of our heavenly citizenship. We're still citizens of heaven. We're still members of the adopted heavenly country, still saved eternally. Our names are permanently written in the book of life because it's written with Christ's blood. And we're still justified. But if we do that, we bring pain on ourselves when we deliberately wander away from all his benefits. Here's an illustration. What happens when you take a burning white hot coal out of a fire and set it out on the side? It starts to cool off, the glow goes away, and it eventually will die. It needs the rest of the coals of the fire to continue glowing white hot. The same is true for us when we remove ourselves from the fellowship, unity, and mission of the church, thinking we can go it alone. Then we start to fade. We start to grow cold, and you can die spiritually. People, guard your heart. Keep short accounts. We need to put our spiritual boot square on the neck of what takes us away from unity and mission and run fully into the arms of Jesus. That's the safe place. That's the best place. It's hard to fall when you're on your knees before him. I'd rather attend a church with a bunch of messed up people that love God than a bunch of religious people who dislike messed up people. 
Religion says, I messed up. Dad's going to kill me. The gospel says, I messed up. I got to call my dad. People, God wants full custody. He doesn't want weekends only. God wants your life, not just an hour a week, not just 10% of your income. He wants you. In him is unity and mission. Because he loves you. Paul continues in chapter 3 to expand on the mystery of why God would extend his love towards not only the Jew but the Gentiles. Because of this mystery, Paul was laser focused to minister to all. The mystery of God's grace has been revealed to him and now he's compelled for years to spend the rest of his life sharing that message to the world regardless of the circumstances he was in. You know, the greatest mystery was Paul sitting back in his prison cell and realizing that that glorious salvation he had experienced was his, even after all he had done to try to destroy the one who forgave him. You see, Jesus healed the one who arrested him. Jesus served the one who betrayed him. And he loves the world who crucified him. Why would he love us so? I can see Paul thinking out loud. I have given Christ countless reasons not to love me. None of them changed his mind. Let's read Ephesians 3, 1 through 7. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gifts of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Paul, in other words, marveled that he too is included. And he calls himself the least of the saints. Something else. Let's read 8 through 13. To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ Jesus to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Faith in him. Therefore, they always say when you see therefore, you're going to find out what it's there for. I ask you to not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. That's some kind of guy. I want to meet that guy. We get to heaven, we're going to get to see all the saints that have gone before. We're going to see Jesus. It's going to be fantastic. The reconciliation of the Jews and the Gentiles. You know, it was prophesied in the Old Testament in books like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. So Paul, in essence, has established his credentials as God's messenger to preach the good news to the Gentiles, who are fellow heirs, members of the same body, along with Jewish believers. You know, as I think about that, it boils it down for me to four things, four questions we need to consider. 
And they are these. Do we long for unity of believers as the Lord does? Do we? Are you one of those who can't wait to get up on Sunday and get over here? You come in early and you stay late? Jesus prayed in John 17, 21. May they all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Here's a second question for you to think about. Do we love all members of God's family? Or are you one of those that says, you know, I forgive you, but I ain't going to cry when you die. It's kind of tough. Do we love members of the family of God? Jesus said in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. Third, are we looking for ways to reach out to those who might need to be feel included? Jesus died and rose for the whole world, folks. You qualify. The family of God is all about inclusion of those who believe and all who believe. People, when we see people come to this church who seem to be alone, our first instinct should be to reach out to them and make them feel welcome and wanted. D-Ray can't do it all, okay? After all, they're brothers and sisters in Christ. They represent family. Some may not know Jesus as Savior. Think about that. You can be Jesus with skin on. And fourth, uh, you know, maybe you are struggling with where your place is with all of this because you personally have never accepted Christ as your personal Savior. You can't point to a date or a time when Jesus came into your life and saved you and changed you. You can nail that down today. You can say yes to unity. You can say yes to the mystery of God's unmerited favor. I've never met one person <laughs> who ever regretted asking God to save them. You know, to have a true view of where we fit into the scheme of things, ladies and gentlemen, we need to see clearly that God has a purpose for our life. It's our job to figure out the what of the will of God. It's his job to take care of the where. God's indescribable gift of Jesus. When you meet him, you find him holding open the door to the treasure house of grace. Attending this church will not save you. Giving of your time and your talents and your money is not going to get you there. It's not how it works. It's when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and accept him as your personal savior. This is what Paul's talking about. That's when you are saved. That's when you're forgiven of your sins. To be remembered no more. You start praying to God and bring up something that happened nine years ago, and he goes, what are you talking about? I don't remember that. He's forgiven it. He's forgotten it. He's buried it as far as the east is from the west. That's a long ways. Folks, listen. Nothing, nothing can ever take that away from you. Life is too short, eternity is too long, family is too precious, and the gospel is too wonderful for us to miss it. Friend, if Jesus is not your Savior, today's the day when you can come to him today and nail it down. Don't go out of this hallowed place without knowing you know he's your Savior. Accept him by faith. That's what Paul's doing. Unity, mystery, mission. It starts by having the king in your heart. Accept him by faith. If God's all you have, he's all you need, folks. God will take care of the rest. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And if he is not your savior, ladies and gentlemen, I want to give you an opportunity to find that true in your heart today and to accept him. Paul would do it. Paul 
Paul sacrificed much so that we could be saved through the teaching and preaching of his word. Just do this in your heart. Ask him, Jesus, to forgive you of your sins. Would you do that? Ask him to change your heart and life today and to save you. Go ahead and do that. And then come follow him. Join the Jews and the Gentiles that Paul refers us to and come follow him today like they did.